Well, welcome to Experience Focus Leaders Podcast. I am super excited to have Blaine Grayboys with us today. Blaine is an artist, an inventor, and a founder. And most recently, on top of all those three amazing things, he is uh, really an investor and an advisor to many other companies. And so we're very excited to have Blaine here to share a perspective of what does it mean to take something that's really creative um, and artist and was, was, you know, you could tell us more about your movie and, and game career um, and, and bring it in the, in the world of um, tr more tr technology and other business investments. So uh, Blaine, tell us a little bit more about yourselves and your, your interesting story. And, um, you know, again, welcome to the Experience of Leaders Forecast. Yeah, thank you for having me, Alex, and really, really glad to be able to contribute to the community that, that you're building. So thank you very much. Uh, well, I guess just biogra biographically, I was born in outside of Philadelphia. I went to college at a very small liberal arts school called Bennington College and uh, very much um, appreciate the experience that I had there and would really say it was the defining um, direction that it put me in. And since then, I've been almost my entire career focused on early stage startups. I started out in the film and TV industry, co-founding the first DVD production company in New York, which certainly dates my career a bit. And from there, I moved into producing video games. And I've can say I've worked on games on every single platform from consoles and PC and mobile mm -hmm. to Facebook and social to even working for about a year or two with DirecTV, creating the first set-top box gaming uh, experience. Went on from there and spent a, the better part of a decade in the esports industry. Mm -hmm. And from there, discovered a problem, if you will, in the casino gambling space and went on to found a company where we invented the first video game gambling machines and ultimately brought that video game gambling experience online as well. And then a few years ago, I moved uh, over to Europe and live over here now. And as you mentioned, I've been focused mostly on investing in what I call idea stage companies. Part of that is because I make modest investments compared to large venture capital firms. I'm one independent person and I can only focus on so much. And companies where I feel as an advisor, I can really make an impact on the the outcome of the company, the success of the company. Well, that's, that's amazing. And I, I think one, one of the things that uh, entrepreneurs struggle with when, when it comes to selecting investors and you know who to work with is is typically the you know is this just capital or is this capital with some you know unique point of view and experience that gives you an unfair competitive advantage beyond capital and so you bring that in spades and for boring people like myself you know i i'm really intrigued by that your experience and in, in kind of film and and tv and and game uh world and how you know, how are you bringing that into other markets, right? Like, so, you know, whether it's going to be to be or, or something that's maybe less glamorous, but still in the, in the customer consumer facing world, you know, what, are, what have you found are kind of the, the playbooks and the uh, areas of expertise that are, you know, easily transferable and all of us could learn from. Sure. Well, the, the two things that, that I just thought of when, when you asked that, the first is, so I, I'm a member of the Producers Guild of America, and I was co-chair of our New York conference and a board member for a while. And so it was really great to interact, and I still do, with some of the you know greatest producers in the world. And one of the things that we always talk about is that producing a show, because everything is called a show, whether it's a film, TV, live event, but producing a show is basically the same as a startup. Uh, oftentimes you have to create an entity and a business plan. You have to recruit the team and the funding. You have to have a strategy. You have to go out and execute on it. You have to market it to consumers. I would say the only thing that's nicer, and it's a lot nicer 
about film and TV and shows is that it, there's actually an end to it. Mm -hmm. There's a date where you're done and it's finished and it's on the wall or in your DVD case or, you know, uh, online for distribution. And the, the thing that I have only learned later in my startup and entrepreneur career and something that I definitely share with companies and friends that I advise or invest or just discussing, you know, these issues with the problem or challenge with taking venture capital or almost all forms of investment is now you're limited to only two outcomes. There are only two outcomes when you take an investment. You will either have an exit, which is the reason everybody invested, or you will have a bankruptcy and the company will close. They are the only two outcomes that are possible because of the nature of what investors goals are which is they want to get an exit and multiples on their invested capital and so i think it really that's the biggest thing that changes i think between if you will you know film and tv you mentioned but other forms of sort of creative production and expression is that they end up having a finish and you can have a finish that's successful without a 10x exit Right. You can have a show that comes out that people like you could put up an art show and maybe a thousand people didn't come, but a hundred did. And you felt really good about it. And now you've shared your art with the world. But the day after it's done with startups and really all businesses, but startups in particular, it's never done. And the outcomes are binary. It's either a win or a loss. There's nothing in between. And I think that's one of the things that's really challenging for uh, CEOs in particular entering the startup space is you don't necessarily have a conception of that. And then the, the other thing that immediately came to mind about the crossover, if you will, between you know film, TV, games and, and startups is mm -hmm. storytelling. Um, Everything is about storytelling. The most powerful words in the English language are, let me tell you a story. You're instantly engaged to want to hear the story. And particularly for early stage companies, it's all about the story because that's all you have. Right. There isn't a product. There isn't a market. There isn't revenue. It's the story of the idea and what that idea, how you'll execute it and what it will become. And I think that's one of the, the best crossovers for people to think about from entertainment to investing or entrepreneurism is what's the story? And it's really that at every stage, right? Even public companies, the things that most people know about the public company are the story about the company. Yeah, it's really funny. We... we um we see that when you say the story, like there's multiple stories to your point, right? There's the sort of the founder story. There is the um, the vision story of, of the company. How far, you know, how, where do you t intend to take it? There is, um, you know, for us, uh, we, we work a lot on helping customers tell the stories of their customers, right? So there's the story of the customers and often the best companies make, customers their heroes not themselves right and they're just a sidekick supporting the heroes and the heroines uh and so i really ap applaud that connection because i i think we we need to be very sophisticated at the storytelling there's multiple levels right it's not just that the you know you you to your point you don't just stop the moment you kind of raise some money oh okay Storytelling is done. Let's get, let's start building things, right? Like <laughs> employee stories, right? Like we have to, um, how do we tell, you know, in a distributed world, how we tell the type of stories that stick uh, so that t people can independently remember, oh, okay, this is the way we run things, right? Like this is how, you know, what good looks like in our organization. Um, so I, I it, it's funny, like it's funny name. you, yeah. you, you touched on the the idea that you know once you finish a raise you're kind of done. Um, I I think is is really interesting because another relationship I do find between let's say entertainment 
and uh, entrepreneurism is when you're doing a show, you're working on it for days, months, years, but then you have this time when it's done. And I find, and a lot of my peers find, that it's not uncommon to get quite depressed after that, even if it's been a success. You've been working on it for so long, and now it's definitively done. And as I talk to startup entrepreneurs and have been one myself, you're working so hard for your fundraise. You're putting everything into it. You're flying back and forth. You're pitching. You're building your team. You're, you're really investing your life into raising this money. And it would seem that closing that money would be elation. It would be the happiest day of your life. And I know for me, and I know speaking to a lot of other entrepreneurs, it's actually quite depressing. And it's not depressing because you have to now execute on it. That's what you wanted to do the whole time. It's sort of depressing because you've been working on something and now it's done. And maybe it could have been better or worse. It doesn't matter. It's done. And you're not able to invest your energy and you know, belief into that part of it anymore. You're moving it into another and it's like the show being over, right? Mm -hmm. You've been investing in this show for so long. You believe it's going to be a success, whether it is or it isn't, it's over. Yeah, it's, it's over. <laughs> That's interesting. So I think, I think if I read between the lines, the answer is we should all be thinking like uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe and just kind of <laughs> Think of a never-ending franchise, you know, and just kind of, oh, okay, this portion is over and here's the next. Um, well, I, have, sure, I, I think that's one way to think about an entrepreneur's journey uh, for, for sure. I, I think a big thing that needs to be considered in the early stage of a company is what do you, how do you really want to accomplish accomplish solving the problem you're setting out to solve mm -hmm. because that's what a company is you're setting out to solve a problem that you want to invest many years in and certainly raising outside capital is one way to do it and there's debt and equity and that sort of thing though i would say in almost all cases and i know you've done some of this there are ways to do it through revenue generation and operations and partnership that often may be, and you'll never know hindsight's 2020, but often may be the better path forward for you to be able to set your goals of, I want to solve this problem. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is raising capital isn't always the answer, and often it's not the right answer. Absolutely. And I think here, you know, we, we in the podcast, we, we support audiences from enterprises to to entrepreneurs who want to create uh, a, a amazing customer and employee and their you know experiences for their stakeholders in general and what you know if you think that's the goal then there's no end for that goal in my view right like you're always iterating you're always learning you're always debugging a little bit your go to market or or kind of what is what is a you know standout experience you know within also was in the cost, right? Like, cause you can't, you know, spend, you know, invest in experiences that are not scalable and repeatable. How can you create maximum value, maximum experience, maximum special moments for your key stakeholders? And I just really doubt that that's changing because the, you know, that's, that's that you achieved it and you're done because the, you know, the market is changing, the expectations are changing, your product is changing. Um, uh, customer needs are evolving, you know, everybody's not like, you, you figure out the best, uh, you know, uh, enterprise SaaS platform, and now AI is coming in and is disrupting you. And so you kind of, AI has its own set of, you know, uh, customer experiences, right? And then, so you need to adapt to that. So I think if that's the guiding star, right, then my, my gut is like, the, there's no end in sight to your, to your point, right? And so like, Fundraising is just a vehicle to to that to that. Yes. And you know, what do you what like you know if we go back to sort of the um, uh, connect, connecting experience 
and you know storytelling to a mission right that elevates you or a vision or mission that elevates you beyond near term and really um you know puts you in the in the way where you you know you're working on something that has long term potential of benefiting humanity right like i think one of our ambitions like what can we do that's going to change the course of human history maybe in a minor way but like what if, what if we can do something that does you know, better for, for the society as a whole. And, you know, we have relate to, for example, are very fortunate to work on reimagining storytelling, reimagining the book, right? These are fundamental, um, uh, fundamental, you know, drivers of progress of civilization, you know, from, from the, from the times of written history, right? And, and so that's easy for us, but maybe, you know, in your experience across different businesses that you worked with, kind of, what have you seen successful teams do to kind of reach beyond that ending point uh, and, and just think, think, think bigger? Sure. Well, I, I love the idea of think bigger. Uh, when you and I chatted the other day, we talked about the book Play Bigger, which is uh, really inspirational to me. And I, I, I think one, there's so many things you could talk about, but one that just immediately jumps to mind is fewest best the less is more approach. And an example that I can give that's very personal is I recently launched a coffee company with a business partner and two other partners. Uh, my partner had been working on the wholesale side of it and her partner and their family have been working with family farmers in Uganda since 1955. They organized the first family farm collectives in Uganda in 1955. And to this day, the families of those farmers still farm on the same land in Uganda. And they needed to find a strategy to release their product to retail in the United States. And I felt like we could really contribute to that. So I ultimately became a founder and an investor in the business. We launched about a month ago. And our mission is a big mission, which is we give 50% of the profits back to the farmers from the retail sale. And that's a really big idea. It's going to take a long time until the promise of that locally has the impact because the money goes to things like planting trees because having the shade from trees is important to grow the crops and it keeps the, the soil um strong so that it doesn't get washed away from erosion and that sort of thing. But the idea that we could work with farmers who have been doing this since 1955 are trying to find a path into the U.S. market, and we could really change the business model mm -hmm. from we'll lowball you on wholesale, we want to buy the thing as, as inexpensively as possible so that we could make the most money possible. Well, instead, there's a new model. We could buy the beans at market rate. Mm -hmm. And then we can also share half the profit with you from retail. And now we've created a supply chain where everyone shares in the benefit that comes out of that. And I think that's a great example. And when I am thinking about fewest best, I put together the website we had tons and tons of material. Again, they've been doing this for almost 70 years, right? With mm -hmm. the farmers, there's dozens of pages of text and blogs and videos and photos that they've created. They've been wholesaling for five years. At the end of the day, if you go to our website, we've distilled it down to four photos and four tiny paragraphs that are two sentences each. And I think if you scroll down our page, it tells a really strong story of we started the first farming collectives, they get 50% of the profit, the coffee's really good, and we work with this amazing roaster, go buy it. Right. And even I can going, remember it. So you, you're kind of narrowed it down. So, <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> well, Alex, that's a great point, which is you need to tell a story that people can easily repeat. Right. right. Because what you're putting out there is what they're. So now if if you said, oh, my friend Blaine started this coffee company. Well, what's unique about it? You could be like one, two, three, four. This is what's unique about it. And I think fewest best really applies to almost everything. 
mean, I basically wear the same thing every day. I'm very simple in my, you know, personal life and habits. I'd rather have something high quality or nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd rather work with a small team than a big team. I'd rather, you know, do one thing that's amazing than 10 things that are, you know, modest. Um, and I, I think that's a way that people can really approach startups through this lens we were talking about of experience and storytelling is how do you really, truly distill it to there? It could not possibly be less. It couldn't be fewer lines of code. It couldn't be fewer photos. It couldn't be fewer words, whatever it is, it couldn't be less. And I think that's a really great, again, there's so many tools you could talk about, but I think that's one tool that we could talk about here that is sort of subjective, but people can actually apply in their business and personal lives. So, so this this reminds me of the quote of uh, Saint Exupéry, which is the perfection is not when you can't add anything, but you can't take anything away. Uh, sort of is is that kind of the essence of, of what you're saying? So it's like. We I, society are let's do more let's create more with ai we can do more we could turn out ten thousand pages of garbage versus one thousand pages I don't, send out ten thousand spammy emails versus <laughs> one thousand and what you're saying is the experiential the storytelling that kind of touches humans is about you know this you know distilling it to the, its essence um, that is, I, I, I do per perfections, a high bar. Yeah. Uh, I'm happy with best. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I think best is a really good target. Maybe you can hit the top tier of best. Um, though there's definitely some perfect art out there. I think for most startups, there's a lot more luck than perfection that, that will be involved. Uh, another way to look at it, let's say from the engineering or the product mindset is, the most expensive feature is the one you didn't need, right? Uh, and so often I see startups and they're like, we have to make X, Y, Z, one, two, three, five million things. And at the end of the day, two of them are actually meaningful and going to be used by people today and now. And the third one and fourth one that you make is wasted money. It's wasted time, it's wasted effort. So, you know, the, the features you don't need are, are the, the biggest waste of time, money, and effort possible in a business. There's different ways to figure out what are the ones you do need and don't need, but certainly building the ones you don't need is, is a very wasteful use of resources. So, so you added this, this dimension of perfection, like excellence, perfection versus, you know, the best. And it's, you know, th there is a lot of research in, in this, it, both in terms of human performance and, you know, and satisfaction with life in terms between the sort of the maximizers and satisfizers, right? Like that's sort of the, 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 the two dimensions. So the maximizers will be seeking for the perfect decision. They will be doing a lot of research, a lot of optimization, burning the midnight oil, making sure, you know, that they get to the perfection so to speak. And then the satisfiers are kind of quickly making a decision that's good enough, right? And then they're moving on and seeing if that worked. Uh, and especially like if we apply startup or any sort of moving and a moving, rapidly moving organization, um, you know, the there's a risk of taking the decision taking too long, especially if this type of decision that's reversible, right? Like you don't want to, that's adaptable, right? If you make very black black go no go decisions that from which there is no return then maybe you do need to be a little bit more maximizer uh but in majority of decisions they're not like that right like majority of them are are it more iterative so what's your take on that and then how does this fit into your framework and your experience and especially in the creative sure. form if you pull it back right where there's rewards for creativity and being a little bit uh you know uh, more on the original side but yet there's sort of formulas to what it makes a great game or what makes a great movie uh, production. So I, I would love to hear that perspective and whether you see similar parallels between good yeah, and I, versus, I, uh, 
I, I'd never heard the uh, um, maximizer satisfier. Um, I don't know if those you know words resonate with me, but I guess I would say the the technique I have arrived at is intuition then analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a pretty big believer from a philosophy of science and neuroscience perspective that we have no idea why we make decisions. There's no school of thought or scientific research that says this is exactly how humans make decisions. We have no idea. But for me, I think a big part of it is just intuition. Uh, and I think then analyze is the important part. So like if you're painting, just intuition all the way, right? Like you're just gonna follow your intuition and creativity and you're gonna arrive somewhere. But if it's in business, you're going to have an idea, but then I think you need to quickly analyze. And when I say analyze, I do not mean forever mm -hmm. to make the perfect decision. I mean, get in the ballpark. And when I say analyze, I pretty much mean open up a spreadsheet and whatever it is, I guarantee there's some math and formulas involved in it. Um, the, the easiest one that I always point out is just revenue models, right? Yeah. That's like the easiest one. Oh, I have an idea about a new revenue model. The idea is cre super creative. It's magical. Um, but then if you can quickly analyze it, and I think it's important, particularly for CEOs, that you can do both of these things, mm -hmm. that you can make a visually compelling PowerPoint or, or you know, presentation and open up a spreadsheet and do some basic calculations. And then what's great about that is that's where you get into a positive iterative cycle, right? Oh, I true. have an idea, but then when I analyze it, it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Oh, it's this one bit here that doesn't work. How could I solve that? Oh, if I just changed my idea a little bit, I could change the formula of how that's working. Oh, now that is something that if only I did have a million users, it would make a bunch of money. Got it. Um, or, oh, I have to rethink how I'm going to go about executing this business. Um, is it, you know, I could give tons of different examples, but uh, I, I think intuition then analyze. Again, for me, it's just the framework that that works. But again, part of it comes down to um, I'm a one man band when it comes to this kind of work, investing and advising mm -hmm. with startups. And so I really have to be able to make a decision, move on. And then, you know, with most investors, the answer is no, because you have very limited bandwidth. And it's not just the bandwidth in the moment. I was just talking with a friend the other day about it. Everything you commit to in life, right? It's an investment, a startup, a relationship. Oh, I'm going to meet you next Tuesday at the restaurant. All of these things that you commit to have the opportunity and certainly will blow up into a lot more than you were expecting them to be at some point. You know, a company you invested in three years ago and have forgotten about, now they're doing a new fundraising round. You're only hearing about it now after the fact. You have to drop everything else that you're doing in your life and spend the next two weeks analyzing it to see where you stand on it. You know, Or you're going to meet a friend for lunch and they cancel and now it's like tons of work rescheduling with them and finding another time to get together. Seemed like an easy investment to say, yeah, mate, I'll meet you for lunch on Tuesday. But now it's turned into three hours of back and forth to schedule another time. And I think, you know, that gets back to, again, fewest best, because there will be unforeseen circumstances and they will eat a lot of your resources at the exact time you don't want it to be happening. That's really interesting. Like that last example just triggered kind of the this thought process that when oftentimes when we think of experiences, we think it has to be absolutely remarkable and something that... Um, just kind of you you want to talk about yell about scream about or you know tell the, the rest of the world about which is great if it happens but there's also the negative experience right like the 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 very opposite of that like the logistics you know example 
And then there's something that's probably quite achievable by by a lot of folks, uh, but you know, is maybe is not going to be incredibly remarkable, but it still like creates positive uh, associations. And I kind of call it frictionless experience, where you mm. you kind of you have some products where you know you get something done and you don't notice you don't notice that like it, it required any mental capacity, you know, co co cognitive processing to do it. And then you only notice it when you don't have that, right? And the the, the next time you're 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 accessing. So like for us, for example, um, you know, in our universe, we uh we, we sort of had a we started transforming PDFs, and then some customers said, "Well, after I've done this, was relate to and seen how my customers respond, I I can't go back, right? But but until they didn't know we existed." And so, like, right. we are shifting a little bit the bar for, for example, what important documents, you know, uh, could look like, what the consumption experience is. And we're noticing that that's sort of forcing pressure on the on the market. Have you seen this sort of evolution over time? You know, you have a, a long, longer career horizon than most. What have you seen in kind of the storytelling quality? Has it is it improving in startups and in, in, in businesses as a whole? And the ability to create higher quality customer experiences, like as you know, any patterns that you're seeing over time. Yeah, I, quality has improved in every aspect of particularly tech businesses, but startups across the board. I mean, there's so many platforms and tools and frameworks and documentation out there that things five years ago would have taken ages and now you could mock up or build it in a day. Uh, one that resonates with me and I think gets back to experiences in PDFs are decks. Mm -hmm. uh, for a, for a, an early stage startup, I think your deck is the single most important asset of the business. It probably needs to be updated many, many times, including after funding, you would want to update it multiple times so that anytime anyone asks you to tell them about the business, you can just send them the deck. And what I always say is in five minutes or less, and five minutes is me really being engaged in liking this thing, I have to get it all and have to be like 90% correct in my understanding and interpretation of it. And whether that means photos or icons or graphics or whatever, that's all up to, you know, in your case, it's your client. The content is the content. Mm -hmm. um, but being able to package it in a way that is engaging, is fun, is easy to download. Sending someone a 35, you know, meg file that's hard for them to download, that's named properly. And, you know, the name makes sense that, is laid out properly inside that's really readable and fun and makes you feel great about it. I, I think it's the single most important asset of a, of a business is, is their pitch deck of five to 10 slides. And again, you're pitching, whether you're fundraising, getting customers or telling the story to a bank where you're trying to get a loan. What, whoever your your or or your parents because you want them to be proud of you, yeah. you know whatever it is, you you've got to be able to um, send someone a PDF that they can open immediately, yeah. that is is a really great experience for them, and yeah. I, I think that you know for me resonates particularly with what you do of how do you make these document experiences, these content experiences perform their, their job, right? The job's different every time, as you said, yeah. um, maybe the job is to sell something, raise money, but the job could also just be change your mind or have you think Educate. about, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, what, what's the thing you have to be exposed to something like seven times before you learn it, or I'm sure seven it's times a, in seven ways. Seven times. In yeah, I'm sure. I'm <laughs> sure we'll get comments debunking that research, and I'm sure it's something else, but it's something like that. So even if you're just one of those seven times, right, then you've accomplished something. 
You might not be able to get analytics for it in your dashboard because you're not a part of that user's journey when it does break through, they make the purchase, whatever it is. But I, I think it's a, it just gets back to, again, this idea of storytelling, fewest, best experience. To me, the pitch deck is the culmination of those things. Well, what I really love about what you're saying, and I think this is whether you're it's storytelling, creating experiences, is you're really talking about the feedback loop, right? Like you're 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 basically saying something that I I think oftentimes gets forgotten by people that are I'm a creator, right? And we have this sort of great kind of creator economy buzzword, but like majority of the people in the creator economy don't succeed because nobody wants to consume whatever they're creating. So they're having fun expressing themselves. And I think that's rewarding. And that's kind of part of human nature. And that's, that's wonderful on an individual basis, but it doesn't lead to some sort of, you know, economic or repeatable productive activity. And I think when we shift to the business world, you know, it's, storytelling has a purpose, it needs to accomplish something. It's not, oh, I'm just like, in the business of storytelling for storytelling, right? Like you have to, yeah. like you said, like get, raise money, educate somebody, change change their way and way they do things, you know, help in healthcare, right? Help people do the right things that are good for them, right? Like, you know, present that information in a way that actually, um, you know, leads to the behavioral change. And that's actually where some of the research that we started applying came out of, like there's like really, you know, fantastic studies on, you know, what helps people take drugs that they, they will save their lives, right? Like, and how you, how you, mm -hmm. pay that uh, information really does matter. So, um, so, so, but then without the measurement, you're just kind of in this creative exercise, right? And you're just exercising one part of your brain and you're having fun and you're, you're, you know, churning stuff out, but the feedback loop is the, is the culmination of and the, the the duration of it is what kind of really gets um standout outcomes for uh from the creativity and i, I don't I, I wonder if you've seen this sort of that loop tighten a, a bit more in in kind of in the various industries right like and i think like in, you know like i would imagine e-gaming that this is the core part of what you know how it, it must work Right, the behavioral the behavioral change. What, but what about other industries? Well, the, the first thing that I thought of, Alex, was uh, so I went to art school and uh, made sculpture and various other mediums. And the core of art school is is crit criticism. It's called crit, and you know you do a bunch of work and you put it up and then you go with your class and you're all sitting there in person in front of your work with you standing there explaining it to them your professors there and in real time people your peers are telling you what they think right i don't think there is a faster better feedback loop than art crit so has technology so, so changed corrected. it i stand corrected so you it it's, has been a core part of you know, the, you could clearly see I did not go to art school, by the way. Right? <laughs> Guilty as charged. It, and what it what it gives you is thick skin, right? Mm -hmm. Because I, I think one of the challenges is getting feedback is useless if you're not going to listen to it. And I don't just mean listen to it in a quantitative or qualitative way or analytical way or A-B testing or that sort of thing. I mean really understand the reasons why. And the corollary to that, I think, for startups is, and this gets back to play bigger as well. Mm -hmm. So the, the core of your pitch deck is your problem statement and your solution statement, right? There's a problem and there's a solution. And something that's only really dawned on me over the last two years is the problem statement isn't actually the important part. It's the reasons and causes why the problem exists that are the important part. And then that's what your solution statement is about, is solving those causes and reasons. And if you solve those causes and reasons in a product or an experience 
that people want to buy or pay for, that's going to be your successful product solving the problem. So I guess the, the way to rephrase it or simplify it is you're not solving the problem. You're solving the reasons and causes the problem exists. The one layer before, before, before. And I have to be honest, it didn't fully, I mean, I have to say in various startups I've been CEO of, I had the reasons and causes in the problem statement. It was driven by a lot of market research and that sort of thing. But it's easy to lose track in the solution side of it, of not focusing back on those reasons and causes. And instead, you're just making something that's great. It's a, it's almost a you know perfect product. And you're getting feedback on it and you're improving it. And maybe you're even making money. And maybe you're even solving aspects of your problem, right? Oh. But you're not actually solving the reason and cause that that problem even exists. That's Maybe you'll be fine. Yeah, that, that's that's a beautiful way of thinking about it. So one of our customers mentioned that like one of the ways why we use you and it's sort of like I never thought of it is like you give me this sort of extra bit of confidence when I'm presenting, you know, because I mm -hmm. have something special. Right. And I kind of I didn't really understand. I didn't think of it like that. We we're like, yeah, well, yes, we give. So you, it's a psychological not speaking, need, right? Like a psychological. So. Need. Eating. Yeah, not psychoanalyzing your client, but it sounds like they're needing confidence, which is fair. It's hard to present in front of people. That's the reason and cause they're having a problem that they came to you. Exactly. And now they've articulated back to you, wow, you're, you're solving this reason and cause that I didn't even articulate to you at the beginning. Yeah, I came to you like, for- You're animating you know, my presentation. Are you making this attractive? I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, 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 the fundamental is like, I just, you know, I just need extra strength as I go up on my really big meeting. And I want to kind of, I, you know, you, I'm the star, but I'm you know, lacking a little bit of confidence. Can you, can you give me some extra umph in my. Uh... That's a great example. I'm going to use your example now. That's a great example of that. Well, I think you connected the dots. I really appreciate it. It's like the root, the cause the root cause is more important than the problem. It's sort of like if I had to summarize. It's interesting that you say root cause in, in regulated gaming, like you're making slot machines or online games and you have a problem that's like looks whatever on the screen, all anyone cares about is the root cause. Uh -huh. It's no one cares about the graphics on the screen. What What's the root cause? Why did this actually happen? And if you have to go down to the molecular level to know that root cause i think that is is absolutely the takeaway and again your example is the best one right it wasn't that they wanted fancy presentations the root cause was they wanted to be more confident well this is this is great co-creation right here you're helping me understand with your same with your thank you experience uh and hopefully this is really helpful to our audience um Blaine, I can't thank you enough for taking the time uh, to walk through and share some of your experiences with us. Where can our audience find you? Is it LinkedIn or like what's the best way to, to connect and follow what you're up to? Sure. The easiest way is Blaine Global, all one word. And if I'm on a platform or the web, that's my website. Uh, it's always Blaine Global. Blaine, thank you so much. What a fun conversation. What a broad range and uh, just uh, really excited for the companies and causes you're supporting. You're, you're bringing a wealth of experience across so many uh, dimensions to them. Thank you again for sharing your time and expertise with us. Thank you, Alex. I really appreciate it. Take care.